recovering from a fever from a few days ago. I'm not contagious anymore, I don't think. But uh, so I might be speaking a little soft, more softly. So if I, you can't hear me, just I'll try to repeat. Um, so I didn't really know what I, what uh, that you wanted me to talk about. So I just thought I'd just share some stories about uh, Aga Matrix, my my three co companies basically. Uh, but a little bit of background: my uh, undergraduate was in. I actually started out in design, uh, in uh, industrial design, and I got talked out of it because my uh, roommate, who was who then became my partner, uh, basically said, you know, he didn't say, uh, you know, you shouldn't do art because you're never going to get a job. He said, you, you know, a real artist uh, doesn't need a degree to do art. And that talked me out of it. So I ended up just studying math, like a lot of other uh, my friends did. Uh, and then I, um, so that was my undergraduate. Then I ended up uh, coming here for a PhD. Um, I originally was going to do math, but I realized I wasn't really good enough to do math. So I ended up in linguistics, which is an easier topic, uh, which is uh, was also a lot of fun. So, uh, but what ended up happening was I dropped out of my PhD to start my first company, which was called Firespout, and it, it was a uh, machine learning and natural language processing. And we made uh, some really neat technology that could automatically summarize documents and automatically categorize documents. This is in the uh, late 90s. Okay, so this is very early uh, machine learning, natural language processing, or a lot earlier than now, obviously. Um, great technology, horrible product, uh, horrible execution, and as a result, the startup failed. Uh, but we did sell the, comp uh, the technology to um, a search engine, Ask Jeeves, so we recovered some money. And then I went back to school and said, okay, that's it. No more startup life for me. And uh, we, um, and then about two months later, so I, I, I finished all my qualifiers, all of my prelims, all that stuff. I, did, I was doing computational linguistics, which actually is kind of a boring field, but uh, it was good for doing a startup. And uh, so I went back in. I was going to finish a PhD in pure theoretical linguistics. Um, I had a great advisor, Noam Chomsky. So I was ready to be a PhD student again. Uh, about two months later, I dropped out again uh, to start my last company, Aga Matrix. And uh, so I moved into an apartment with uh, my high school, a guy I've known since, and this is the guy who talked me out of being an art student. And he, uh, we, uh, we just moved in. I, I lived behind this wall that you can see there. We built the wall ourselves out of homo soap, which is like this material that, like a thick paper, basically. And I lived behind that wall, he lived in the other room, and we basically decided to do a startup together. We didn't really know what we were going to do together, we just knew that we wanted to do something together because we really trusted each other, and uh, we knew that we, you know, I used to work at Microsoft, and that's why I learned how to program. I didn't actually know how to take any computer classes, so I, I learned on the job. I was very good at interviews, so I nailed the interview, I got there. They realized that I don't know how to program, so they had to teach me, and then, so I learned how to program. Uh, I wasn't very good at it, but good enough to hold my job. Uh, so I stayed there for a couple of years, then did uh, grad school. And then, uh, um, anyways, so that was my, my history there. And so Sridhar and I, we uh, decided, and he used to work at GM, so we both worked at big companies, but we didn't really feel like we fit in. We're like, okay, it's, there's nothing wrong with a big company. It's a great, stable life. It just wasn't for us. We're, we're, both of us are inventors. We both like to come up with stuff and bring it to market. So we felt the startup life was for us. So, uh, but we didn't want to build another uh, IT company. You know, we didn't want to build like another, uh, we wanted to do something that had more meaning. So we said, okay, let's try life sciences. And we didn't know anything. We were in our mid-20s, so sure, anybody could do a medical device company. It's not true. Um, so if we would have known how hard it was to do it, I don't know if we would have done it. You pan the camera, this is me on the other side of the room. And so uh, we went through a number of different business models. We were going to do web crawling, and then remember, remember the people used to build web crawlers, you know, now it's like, who does that? Um, and then uh, we were going to do uh, database cleaning. We were going to, a number of ideas, and we eventually ended up in diabetes because it was like this giant space. Everybody's getting fatter, you know, it's reimbursed by insurance, healthcare bills are going out of control. Great, huge market. Surely we can make some money there. So uh, we, decided to work on that. Uh, his, his PhD is in electrochemistry, so he knew a lot about sensing. So. 
So we actually came up, uh, my math, his electrochemistry, we came up with a new way of making sensors more accurate just by using better signal processing. Okay, and up until then, people didn't believe that was possible. So what ended up happening was we, uh, we, we breadboarded it and we showed that it was true. Uh, you might even be able to deduce what we're doing here a little bit, but very simple, it's actually a pretty simple circuit. And we were kind of surprised that no one had done this. Uh, because all of the work in biosensors up until then was by biologists and chemists trying to make sensors more accurate, more specific. Where we're, we're saying, look, actually, you're not using all of the sensor signals. Let's clean up the signal and, I don't know, maybe get some more information out of it. It actually worked. We doubled the accuracy of a glucose sensor. And so we got fi uh, financing. So investors in my first company who lost money in the first company invested were the first investors in my second company. And I remember having the conversation saying, okay, are you sure about this? You lost a lot of money in the last company, you know? I mean, you didn't lose all of your money, but you did lose a lot of it. Um, so like, no, no, we trust you, you know? Uh, okay, so, and just like every startup, when you raise money around, you have to have a t-shirt party, right? So we got, we printed t-shirts with a logo, and we, we got the t-shirts. So these are the first three employees. Me, Shri, head of engineering, uh, head of science, and uh, head hustler. We, uh, we came out of uh, this 411 Mass Ave. Have you ever, you know where Mary Chung's is in Central Square? So, uh, or the McDonald's in Central Square? Uh, it's right, right next door to it. So this basement is, it was in Central Square. It's hosted three of my companies, all three of my companies. Fire Spout, grew up, raised venture financing. Uh, we raised like $8 million and then we, and then it blew up. And then we did Aga Matrix. Uh, we, grew out of here as well. We raised uh, 22 million in angel financing, which is unheard of. Even today, it's unheard of. And then we subsequently raised another 30 or so. So altogether, 50 plus million in, in uh, capital financing. And so it's, it's been, and the company's really kind of grown since then, and I'll tell you the story. Um, so <coughs> it turns out making uh, glucose meters. So do you know, and does anyone here know anyone with diabetes? Diabetes? Sure, you surely, uh, yeah. M pretty much most people, it, it's a huge problem in society today. Um, when you have diabetes, you have to test your blood sugar, right? And then uh, based on that number, you either take insulin to take it down, or you go for a run to take your number down, or you eat something to take it up. Um, and But it turns out that this business model of making glucose meters more accurate with our better sensors, bad product idea, okay? Because glucose meters are given away for free. So basically, you're making a free product more expensive. Okay, so bad for business. Uh, turns out it's the strips where you make all the money. It's the recurring revenue, it's the strips. It's like the razor, razor blade model, right? You make money on the razors. Uh, razor blades, not the razors, right? <clears throat> okay, so we're like, okay, well, we're gonna make our own strips. And someone forgot to tell us that making your own strips is very hard. So we like slaved through it. We were barely able to make our own strip. It kind of worked, and people were really impressed. Like, how in the world did you make your own strips? Usually, it takes like tens of millions of dollars of financing. What they didn't realize was our strips, while they sucked, they actually worked with our system because we could double the accuracy of uh, of the strips. So we. Uh, oh, so. The, uh, so it doubled the accuracy of the system, and uh, and so we could work with crappy strips. And that's what we ended up uh, doing, and we um, uh, that was it. So we uh, we ended up uh, shifting our business model again because making our own strips is very difficult. So we ended up going to Asia, buying really bad strips uh, that couldn't pass the FDA. But with our system, because of twice the accuracy, it, it could pass the FDA. Not only did it pass the FDA, it was actually more accurate than other systems out there. Unbelievable. So we got FDA clearance, we got our first customers, we shipped our first product in 2006, uh, th four pallets of products, it was kind of a historic event for us. Um, and then we got out there and we made our, let's see here, one, two, our third mistake, which was uh, we ended up trying to build our own consumer brand. Also really idiotic because it's very expensive to build a consumer brand. You know, this is before Facebook in those days, right? It's like 2005, right? Um, so social media, all that stuff is not really widely acceptable. Uh, I mean, it didn't exist. Um, so it was really tough. And we uh, lost a lot of money doing that. 
So we shifted again to another business model that was selling to private label, which means you make stuff and you put, let other people put their brand on it and they market it. And that worked out great. Uh, and so as a result of that, our capacity, our demand for the product went way up. And so with that, we uh, built another factory. We went back to, to Asia, in Korea actually. We built one of the largest biosensor factories in the Pacific Rim, 1.3 billion strip capacity a year. So it's still there, it's cranking out strips like crazy, it's great. Um, the Korean government put, put in a few million bucks, we put in a few million bucks, and the Korean subsidiary, like a partner company, put in some money, and it was just a great success. Um, and then along came, and then we're like, okay, we're making, we're doing well in this business, making meters and strips, great. Um, what, what's next? You know, this thing called the iPhone is coming along, it's 07, right? We're like, hmm, you know, I, I think people are going to programs on these things someday, you know, and I bet it's going to be a big deal. And so it's like, I know, how about if we make a diabetes program that runs on the phone, you know? And uh, we approached Apple, and they said, absolutely not. Like, we are media, entertainment, video, music, you know, but we don't do medical stuff, so get lost. So we kept, we basically did not take no for an answer. Okay, they're like, well, what if we help you know, indemnify you and like, we'll sign stuff? No, no, no. We still didn't take no for an answer. We kept coming back, coming back, coming back. Nine months later, they approve us. We've become the first hardware medical device that Apple uh, approves for their system. And of course, it's easier for everybody else afterwards because now there's a form that you just fill out. Yes, we're a medical device. Yes, we're cleared by FDA. Accept it. Okay, so. But, you know, I guess it's nice to say you're first, but it doesn't actually benefit you that much. Uh, so we made the, that, it was a glucose meter that works with the iPhone. I think you guys have seen that before. Um, actually, I might have one right here with me. The, uh, and then uh, we did this huge partnership with, oh, we, we did this huge partnership with uh, Sanofi. It's a big drug company, one of the largest. And, uh, and they loved it. They loved the Apple thing. You know, the big pharma, their, you know, brand is just not a, uh, well, as well known as Apple, for example, but uh, they, they really wanted to diversify their base and get into blood glucose monitoring. So they partnered with Agri Matrix to make this, this product. I mean, this was <coughs> this was a labor of love, you know, and we were obsessed about all the details that you'd normally be obsessed about to get it just right. Uh, I'll pass it around. Um, and so, reflecting it over the last ten years, you know, we really. Uh, had a lot of fun, learned a lot of stuff. Uh, now we're more than just in our, you know, our, in our late 30s now. Uh, we can look back and really enjoy the last 10 years of just like, wow, this has really moved along as a good business. You know, business is now, uh, you know, moving quickly towards the 100 million revenue mark, and so it's a good business. Sridhar now is running that business. Um, I left the company uh, a year and a, about 14 months ago to start my new company. And we, um, we, uh, uh, yes, we're still major shareholders, Sridhar and I, but we, um, you know, so Sridhar's running that business and I'm doing the new company. And so um, we've learned a lot uh, over the last 10 years, we learned about regulatory stuff, reimbursement, which is like insurance, uh, clinical studies, how to talk to doctors, how to do marketing, how not to do marketing, um, learned a lot about design. You know, I've always wanted to do this, you know, in college and didn't get a chance to. Finally, I get a chance to do this uh, in, at work and uh, work with some of the best designers in the world. And uh, we won a lot of awards and stuff like that, but the best, uh, the best accolade, I'd say, ever was when we had a chance to demo it to a very important person at Apple, and he basically said, well, not bad. So we're like, okay, that's like the best award, a design award ever. So, uh, and then comes uh, the next story, which is this bit. We, 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 uh, I leave the company. I, I've been getting to know John as a friend, John Scully, uh, for the last two years. And, uh, and he's like, you know, and uh, I talked to him and we're like, hey, we should just start a company together. You know, it's kind of weird because he's like 74 now and I'm not, you know, like half his age. And he's, uh, so he's thinking, and I'm like, okay, let's do it. It's kind of an unexpected couple, but that's cool. Uh, so Sridhar, me and John, we put in money for the first round um, of financing, our, our seed round back in October. We actually found the company the day that Steve Jobs died, which is weird. So we actually named the company after Steve. 
Um, and so we've uh, been working quietly uh, on a number of things. Um, we worked on wearable technology. Uh, that's the basic idea. And the, the insight that we got from the last 10 years was, oh, man, if we could just save hassle, we can reduce, 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 make things simpler, then users will love you for it. Uh, will love you forever. And, uh, and making things simple is about making all the difficult decisions that, you know, throwing things out that you were like, oh no, we gotta have this in there. It's like, no, just have the, have the guts to like throw it out, you know? And uh, so we did, and we were, we're working on a number of different projects, and this one kind of came up, you know, we watched how some of the other pedometer companies are doing really well, and we thought, we thought man, if people are gonna pay $100 for a pedometer, like, we should totally get into, I mean, that's easy. We could like burp out the product, you know, like that, it would be better. And so we dedicated ourselves to making a great, to redesigning that category. So we uh, came up with the Shine. It's a tiny little thing. Uh, did you have one, Richard? I can't pass this around because it's company <laughs> policy. But I you can come up afterwards and see it. But, uh, you, know, you know, these guys are kind of a competitor. You may have seen one of these guys. This is, this is not our product, it's a Fitbit. Okay. And this is the Shine. And one of very few actually are seeing it in person. So you can come up afterwards. I'll show you the, the, the data transfer. Everybody wants to see the data transfer. Um, the way it works is it's just, uh, we just decided to make things something that was just timeless, you know. Um, I gave my sister, I was telling people that I gave my sister-in-law an iPod, uh, an iPod. It was, didn't have the iPod touch or anything like that. It was just called the iPod back then. Uh, second generation, it was like $500 I bought it. It was like a 10 gigabyte iPod. It was like the coolest thing ever. And she, um, she loved it. She still uses it to this day, like eight or nine years later or whatever it is. It's crazy. So we um, were like, I, I, I mean, what, what product lasts eight or 10 years in today's, it, 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 you know, it, it, these days, you know? Like, and so if you can make something that can last that long, that would be unbelievable. So we, um, we wanted to make something that was timeless, something that was built to last a lifetime. And we wanted something that was really wearable, because the insight we had was, if you can make things wearable, then that's like one less thing that you can carry with you, okay? And so um, the dedication was to simplicity and to wearability. And so we figured, what, what makes things wearable? Uh, things are wearable because it's comfortable to wear, you feel comfortable wearing it, it's really useful, and the other thing is it's either invisible or it looks great, you know. It's, you know, if it makes you look like a doofus, then it's not wearable, right? Uh, no matter how useful it is. And so, you know, you have products like this, which are great products. They reinvented the category in some ways. So, you know, people spend a hundred dollars on a wireless pedometer. It's insane, uh, but it kind of proves that there is kind of a market on it. So we decided to go with metal. We explored a number of different materials: ceramics, metals, leather, and we found a co really cool material that that we really liked, it just looks great. And, uh, but because it's all metal, we had to figure out a way to transfer the data. And you know, everyone here has probably taken physics at least once, uh, Faraday cage, right? So, uh, so you can't use Bluetooth, you can't use ANT, and people are like, oh, I know, it's NFC, I'm like, RF, you know? <laughs> so, so no, we don't use NFC, and, but we found a new way of transferring data, it's really cool. Um, we haven't talked too much about what it is uh, because we're still making sure that it works very robustly before we roll it out. Um, but it's it looks like it's uh, working pretty well. So that's it. the way it works is you just lay it on the phone and then it transfers the data. You know we want it like ultimate in simplicity, and uh, it actually comes from um, uh, it comes from a scene uh, from Iron Man where. He Stark like lays down his USB drive on the table, and the data comes out. You know, and so we wanted to do the same thing, and uh, and it's metal, so you you can't use Bluetooth. You know, so we got to do something really different. So, anyways, we figured out a, a neat way of doing that. We wanted to keep it really, really small, you know, uh, but not so small. But I mean, it was only so we could only make it so small. Um, so it's uh, just a few quarters thick, and it's roughly the size of a little bit wider than a quarter. And you can wear it anywhere. So you can wear it, you know, instead of having, you know, trying to put that on, you just, whoop, that's it. And it's super strong, so 
It's got a magnet on it. So you could wear it anywhere on your body. You could, uh, you know, just put it on your collar here. Well, just clips right up. And it's, you know, it won't fall off. Um, and uh, wear it on your wrist, your ankle. You know, some women I've talked to want to wear it as a hair, hairpin. Great necklace. A lot of people talk about necklace. Um, and recently, we, uh, we've always wanted to do something with leather. You know, it's like, what electronics people do leather, right? And so we introduced this leather band, which basically enables you to wear it anywhere. And when we say wear it anywhere, it's not just on your body, but you can wear it to, you know, uh, the spring formal, just as comfortably as to your friend's birthday party. That, that was the idea. So I don't know if you'd wear this to a spring formal, but you, you, you might wear one of these, you know, on a watch. So it actually doubles as a watch when you tap it, it gives you a clock, which is really cool. So, yep. So why don't you turn it become a watch? It does. It does. So it actually functions as a watch. One hit gives yeah. you uh, minutes, and a blinking dot is an hour. So, so, you, so we have a watch. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. Cool. So uh, everybody wants a watch, so we give them a watch. So one hit gives you the time. Two hits gives you your progress. So you how much activity you've done. And uh, that's it. So. I, um, that's that's the story in a nutshell uh, of uh, you know a failed startup, second startup that did pretty well, and the third one you know uh, we're still working on it. We just launched a product actually like two weeks ago. I don't know if you guys saw it uh, on Indiegogo, which is a crowdfunding platform, and uh, the idea there is to get the product out so that uh, to see what people will say, like ah it sucks, I don't want to buy it or uh, sure, I'll buy it, maybe, or yes, I'll definitely buy it. And we've had the whole range of responses. Uh, but overall, I would say it's pretty positive, you know. Um, so has anyone heard of Kickstarter or Indiegogo? Kind of? So the way it works is um, it's a crowdfunding site, which means you post a project. Like, let's say, you know, I want to uh, do a project uh, to study uh, orangutans in Tanzania. And I need $5,000 to do it. Please support my cause. And you can put your cause up on this crowdfunding site, and then you email your friends. Please contribute $5, and if you do, I'll I'll, I'll send you a postcard. You know. And so that's your typical Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign. Or I'm thinking about making a new music album. You know, uh, please support my music album. Okay. But companies and groups are beginning to do this for products now. We're like, hey, I want to make this. You know, I need $100,000 to make it, to prototype it, or I have a prototype, I need $100,000 to tell a bunch of people in China to help to make it. Um, then, you know, please contribute. If you contribute, then I'll give you one of these when it comes out. So it's almost like a pre-order, you know? And so we, uh, we decided to do that, not because we needed the money, but more we wanted to see who people want this product. Because it is kind of a weird product. It's like completely different from this, you know? Like people, you know, it doesn't have a, it doesn't look like it has a screen. This has a screen, you know. It just tells you it's, it's got these weird dots, you know. It's all metal. Like maybe people want plastic, you know. So we wanted to test that out. So we posted it, and the uh, response so far has been pretty good. So uh, and what you do is you, you have to post your like funding requirements. Like I need five thousand dollars to go to Tanzania, or I need, in our case, a hundred thousand dollars to take this to production. And so, uh, but yeah, I was happy to say, say that uh, actually, I think we, uh, you get kind of addicted to looking at the uh, at the screen. But uh, we are now the uh, fourth most funded campaign in history, in uh, Indiegogo history, and we still have about uh, three and a half weeks left in the campaign. So we actually nailed our funding uh, goal within nine and a half hours. It's like only in 2012. <coughs> so I am like a big fan now of crowdfunding. We had 1,400 orders. Um, we had 1,400 orders within the first nine and a half hours from 48 countries, 50, all 50 states. I mean, it's really like truly only in 2012 that something like that happened. No marketing effort, no PR firm, none of that stuff. So um, anyways, uh, just a testament to like today's technology, I think, you know, and if you guys are ever curious about crowdfunding or doing that kind of thing, come talk to me. I, we've thought about it a lot, you know. And uh, um, it's been fun, actually. Jack's finished. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, all right, I'll plug it up to a quick plug for the company. Uh, we're hiring, you know, we, we got financing. Oh, that's the other thing is we raised uh, a lot of venture capital money in April this year. So we raised uh, almost uh, like more than seven and a half million dollars from the top VCs, you know, Coastal Ventures and Founders Fund. The guys who started PayPal and uh, Tim O'Reilly, you may have read some of his books, you know, uh, they're all investors in the company now. And so uh, we're, we're, everybody's waiting to see Misfit do great things. Uh, we've got a great team now in San Francisco. We've got, uh, it's a crew of, um, actually I'll show you the crew. Uh, there we go. So that's the San Francisco crew. And we also have a crew in Vietnam. So industrial design and mechanical engineering and Hardware engineering, firmware, that's all in San Francisco. We're missing a few people from there. And we also have a great crew in Vietnam. 20 people, 22, or something like that. Uh, uh, mostly developers, a few designers, and some data scientists, about uh, four or five PhDs in like math or machine learning, that kind of thing. So um, kind of anything hardware related we get we do up there, and anything software and data science and like math related down there. In Vietnam, um, and so Jack and I, we split our time between the two places. We're looking for more people to join us. Uh, so if you, if anyone here, or if you know anyone who's interested in like going to Vietnam and working there, getting like a really meaningful, a fun job, come talk to us because we. Um, I actually, many of these folks, they they are, um, they were educated overseas, maybe third and a half or something like that. Were PhDs or master students or whatever in the U.S. and then they came back to Vietnam because they didn't want to live in the U.S. and they uh, they get paid really well, and people like way above the market rate in Vietnam, and they get to do cool stuff, you know, machine learning and uh, uh, crowd source data generation, sensor analysis, all that stuff. So you know, they're at the and so we have like a little bubble of Silicon Valley inside in Hoi yeah, you know, like in this tiny little, I mean, you walk into the building, it looks like government building, but when you walk into the room, it's like, okay, look, it's actually nicer than the San Francisco office. Um, yeah, so if anyone's interested, let, let us know. Uh, love to have you. Any, any questions, or? Yeah? What did you learn from the film startup that helped you for the next one? Um, I would say one of the big, biggest things I learned from Firestar was one, focus on product. Duh. You know, we were focused on technology. Like, no one like, buys technology. People buy products. Um, okay, so it's kind of a stupid thing that you should probably know before you start a business. Um, the other thing is, I think I learned a lot about what it means to think about the user. I, I feel like I've gotten better, like slowly better over the course of each startup uh, in terms of knowing how to think about the user. Like, I. So from Firespot, I would say, think about problems that I already have, then work on those. Like, you shouldn't work on products that you wouldn't actually normally use yourself. That's kind of pretty important. And then from Matrix, one of the things I learned probably is actually how not to listen to customers, actually. Like, one of the things is people always say, oh, you should ask the customer for what they want and get the feedback. I'm like, that is the stupidest thing ever. Like, focus groups, bad idea. Very, very bad idea. Like, I don't know why people do that. We did it multiple times at Alchematrix, and basically we got zero insights. Because users do not know what they want. Users, it's our job to know what users want, not their job. So you can watch users, but you don't, like, Ask them, like, how would you like a wearable device? Like, you know, make it red, you know? And so they, don't, they just don't know what they want, you know? And, and the ones who think they do, that's like the most dangerous because they're very vocal and they think they know what they want, but they don't actually do. And they may know what they want, but they definitely know, don't know what like, everybody else wants. So, uh, so learn a lot about that. Learn it the hard way. <laughs> Any other questions? I mean, we get to the crowdsourcing, like other than from the friends and like people you know, like who else do you get well, from? Yeah. Um, so press helps a lot. Uh, search engine optimization and YouTube helps a lot. I mean, we had like 560,000 views of our video. That helped a lot. Um, and we only paid, we, we spent like, a friend of ours owns a company that does media buying 
and he basically gave us some free media that was left over, just like five thousand dollars worth of free YouTube ads, like that we were like, well, we don't have any money, so and said, so, well, we do, we just don't have any money to pay for advertising, and that helped us get things going, and then it just kind of exploded, um, and then. Um, <coughs> <laughs> friends and family is definitely not enough. You know, like you either go nuclear and uh, the campaign blows up, or it's like a, a cluster bomb and you just kind of pop, 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 and you get like maybe twenty thousand dollars in backing. You know, but to get, I mean, we're not even there yet, to be honest. You know, uh, but like to get to a million or two million, maybe five million dollar campaign, you need a significant amount of press. You need social media blow up. You need, you know, uh, you need support from lots of different networks not just your friends and family. So press helps a lot, you know? So if, the, if you, there's an interesting story, interesting product, people will write about this stuff. You know, people like to write about that. They don't want to write about the next Windows phone or whatever, you know? Nothing wrong with Windows phone. Um, do you manufacture your product, or do you outsource to some other company? Say again, say again. Or do you outsource your product, or do you manufacture your product? Hmm. Or, and uh, I think the second part of my question is, um, coming from a technology background, what do you face when you start uh, start your own company? Like dealing with people and um, funding resources and finance, you know? Yeah, sure. Um, <coughs> so, uh, yeah, so we have a partner that makes it for us. You know, you have to define everything, you have to build the tools and set up the machines and all that, and then they like hire people to make stuff for you. So we do that. Uh, um, so that's the answer to your first part, the first part of your question. Uh, the second question was uh, challenges for building a company having just a tech background. Um, it's true, you know, I think if you're typecasted as a tech person and you're like, oh, I'm just a tech person, doesn't know anything, yeah, you need like a business person. It's like, well, um, <clears throat> so you might face that. I mean, I definitely face that you know, coming out of MIT, you know, like what else do I know, right? Uh, but I think over time, I think one can earn your way in, you know? And it's really how, um, and at the end of the day, the technology f founder is the most important, is like the more important of the two founders anyway. You know, like at least in Silicon Valley, everyone's looking for the technical founder, like everybody else is the business founder. But the thing I would warn is, <clears throat> just be really careful about picking your business partners, you know? like. I have a rule generally that if I haven't worked with someone for at least five years, I don't want to work with them. I know it sounds like a crazy rule, but uh, it's worked for me. You know, like I've always worked. You know, Sridhar, I've known him for 20 years uh, since the end of high school. We're roommates in college, so there's a tremendous amount of trust. So people say you shouldn't work with friends, and I think contrarily, you should absolutely work with friends. In fact, you should only work with friends if possible. Um, because if it's not a real friendship, then if it's a real friendship, it should last the stresses and the strain of business creation, of founding a business. So uh, I started with one of my best friends, Sridhar, and we argue all the time and we get on each other's nerves. We're opposites in every way, uh, but we, <clears throat> but I think that's why we were a powerful pair, because he was good at all the things that I was bad at. <coughs> so yeah. Choose, choose wisely. Um, so you mentioned about trust that one of the biggest elements in some choosing uh, your business partner. Yep. Is there other category you're looking at? Yeah, so trust is a big one, but that's not like the only thing, you know. Um, I, I would say complementation of skills is really good. and Or even better, complementation of personality. Like, you know, do, does anyone, has anyone heard of the Myers-Briggs test? You know, it's like a personality test. You know, it tells you whether you're like introvert or extrovert or whether, you know, that kind of thing, right? And so like, on, and there's like four dimensions, introvert, extrovert, and then like sensing versus intuitive, thinking or feelings person, and then like, you know, rules or no rules. And like, on all four, Sridhar and I are opposite, you know? It doesn't mean like, there's no good or bad, it's just who are you, you know? And we, uh, so complementation is a, is a good one. I think the other thing is the stomach for loss, okay? That's a big one. Like. Can you deal with loss? Can you deal with tragedy? And can deal with failure? Okay, like we went, like at Agamatrix, we, okay, we definitely went to the point where we were not only 
zero, but we are insolvent in the bank. We were insolvent, okay, meaning like below zero cash balance. We used credit cards to pay for salaries, and then we used our own life savings to pay for salaries for like we did that for like two or three months, and then we raised money, and then we um, and we did that again, raised more money, and then we almost did that again, okay, and then so it was like several humps, and we got sued like six times by big companies, big scary companies with big law firms, with, you know, and we had to hire our big law firms to pay them a lot of money to, just to defend ourselves. I mean, like we had key employees leave. Like, oh my god, I can't believe Craig left. He's like our key engineer. Oh no, we're gonna die, we can't do it anymore. Turns out you're fine, you know? <laughs> or, uh, oh my god, JJ just sued us. Oh man, we're toast. Uh, it's fine. We actually won, it was awesome. Um, the, I mean, $700,000 later, we won. Was that a win or? I don't know. Um, the, so, uh, you know, you, you, you go through these together and you have to be able to, like, deal with that. Like, can you, because at some point, some a lot of people are like, you know what, I, I need to start a family, I, I gotta go. I'm going to Vietnam, I'm gonna start my orphanage. I'm just, I'm good, you know, like the startup thing's not for me. So finding a founder that has the stomach for loss, you know, and can last through that, that's not easy, man. It's, you know, because, and Sridhar is that kind of person, just will not, like you, someone who won't take no for an answer. That's the other thing, you gotta learn how not to take no for an answer, you know, just, at some point, okay, fine, you can take it, you know? Okay, thank you, you know? And, um, and treat us like that as well, in his own way. So, I don't know, does, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, oh, sharing values is also a big deal. Big, big deal. So, Sridhar and I, one of the big things we share is our, about how we spend money. We are really, really cheap, you know? And we vowed that no matter what we do over time, we would not change the who we are. If we hit financial success, we will not change, you know. If we don't, we won't like be pessimistic. We'll just be who we are. Which we're inventors and we're designers. We like to come up with stuff and work with great people and that's it. That's that's what we like to do. Solve great problems, tough, tough, tough problems. That's, and we haven't changed, you know. So we uh, so we you know, we still fly coach class, we still, you know, live in like we live in a studio. And we live in a room in someone's house, you know? Like we live very basically and treat us the same way. And I think that's really important if you share values, especially financial values. You know, because once you have money, you start, oh, we can, like when we raised Series A, we closed, like, back at Agri Matrix, $3.5 million. Oh, wow, 3.5 million bucks. And we celebrated by going to Taco Bell. You know, we did a round with Coastal Venture. Vinod Coastal, like, he's, you know, well-known investor in Silicon Valley. And we did Founders Fund, like Peter Thiel, all those guys, right? Um, $7.6 million. We went to Taco Bell for to celebrate, and uh, so sharing of values is a big deal. Like, and in fact, hiring employees based on values is probably the most important thing you can do. You know, we used to think, oh, we need IQ and we need like more experience. It's like, yeah, that's good too. You need smart people, but people who share your values is like above all the most important thing. Sorry, long answer. Yeah. Yes. Um, what's your vision for the company in the next five to ten years? Um, that's my first question, and the second one is that, um, you know, um, what are some ways that we, we can encourage entrepreneurship and uh, risk-taking culture in uh, in Vietnam? Mm, okay, sure. Uh, so I, I, we at Misfit Wearables, we're focused on a very specific problem, and that is, so we have it, it is basically to solve I think a pretty tough problem in possibly an entirely new field of comp computation. So 1980s, we had desktop computers, remember? And then, not, oh, not even, was anyone here born in the 80s? No, one, two, maybe? Okay, so I was born in the 70s, all right? So, now in the 90s, we had network computers. That was the big innovation. And then the 2000s, mobile computing. And now, it's, you know, post-PC era with cloud computing, Dropbox, and iPads, right? And so what is 2015 to 2030? I actually think wearable computing is like maybe one of those things, one of those big things. And wearable computing, to be really a big deal, has to be wearable. If it makes you look like a dork, it is not wearable. Okay? So it just, it has to look, make you look good. It, you have to feel good, it, or it has to be invisible. And so we were working on wearability of computers and sensors. That's, that's what we're working on. Um, 
And uh, I, I don't know, I think it could be a big thing. We might be early, I don't know if it knows. It's very easy to be early with a tech startup these days, or just in general, right? And being early is just as bad as being late. Uh, but as long as you're there, it's better than not, it's better late than never, right? Uh, in terms of Vietnam, you know, I, it would be awesome if um, more and more, it, so I think one of the biggest things, I mean, okay, just back up a little bit. You know, we went to Vietnam because we had this belief that people in Vietnam can do more than just outsource labor. You know, and so we're very careful about that. You know, in Vietnam, our team in Vietnam is not outsource. We don't outsource. In fact, actually, I tell people we outsource to San Francisco from Vietnam. Okay, we, you know, we, we get all the hardware engineering done over there. You know, they, you know, they're really good. At that. But all the advanced research and data science, we do that in Vietnam. That's because that's the only place where I can get. You know, Olympiad medal winners and ACM finals team members and who, will, who actually work with me rather than run off to Google, you know, and make a 1% tweak to the Google engine. It's like, no, no, let's build something new here. So we, uh, but I would say the one thing that's painfully missing, it's, I'm, it's like, it sucks. I wish we had more of this and I think as this changes, man, there's going to be a revolution, or, or in a good way, uh, over there in terms of just the number of startups and successful companies. And that's product knowledge, user knowledge, okay? You know, you have a lot of smart guys over there, a lot of smart women, great, some great designers, but nobody knows how to make a product. It's the, weird, it's the weirdest thing, you know? I'm like, dude, that was the dumbest design. I can't believe you suggested that design. Like, why would you, you know, Put the make three screens for sign up. Why don't you make it one with one touch button? That's it. You know. It's, oh yeah. Okay. I, I didn't think of that. Well, use the product yourself and see if you like it. Oh yeah. It does kind of stuff. Okay. See. So I mean, these are very basic things. You don't need an Olympiad medal to be able to design something like that. You just need. This is a common sense and getting used to products and being able to put yourself in a sh in user's shoes. I think that just comes with time. I think with one iteration of product development, I think people will get used to it. They're like, oh, okay, uh, okay, I, I think I know how to think about products now. And then you make another one, and hopefully, Misfit, we can contribute a little bit. And we tell all the employees, like, please, feel free to leave and start your own companies. We'll support you. Do it, you know? Because um, if that's what you want to do anyways, you should do it, you know? And I, hopefully, they will take with them some of the product thinking that they had at Misfit with them. You know, we're not the best product people necessarily, but we I think we we've done it before, so we can bring and so like if so to answer your question, how can we get entrepreneurship to happen in Vietnam or more? Well, go join startups, go join companies, learn how to build products, go back, bring that knowledge with you, teach people how to do the products. You know, consumer products. You know, I mean, we're, we're doing consumer products, and, but even non-consumer products. I think people would love to learn how to do those. Because, but bring your consumer thinking. You know, make things easy, make things intuitive. You know, so in terms of knowing how to program and design, I mean, like hands down. I mean, they're sorry, there's more talent over there than at MIT. Than at MIT you know, so uh, you just, they just it just has to be harnessed. You know, all, all that talent has been building like Accenture websites and building some out of one else's product for years, you know? Like, that's that doesn't develop product knowledge. You know, that's just like, hey, do this, and I'll pay you. No, 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 do that. No, 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 do this. You know, like, that's the interaction right now. It's lame. No one learns that way, you know? But if the interaction is more, we need a good fitness tracker. Make it. Here's the money, go make it. You know, that, and then if, if the output can be a great product, all right, that, that's, That'll be much more, I think, helpful for the entrepreneurial community over there. In terms of you, you, that, that would be a market for more maturity. Sorry, long-winded answer. Um, so, in your answer to the previous questions, you mentioned a lot about like never giving up on an answer. Right. Stemming philosophy. So it sounds like it's never give up no matter what happens. So when, like, or well, what does it take, and when is time to know that okay, yeah. it's time to Yeah. So it's not really never give up. That's I think it's actually kind of bad advice. Um, has anyone here read the Lean Startup? It's a great book, okay? So if you haven't read The Lean Startup, just, okay, write it down. It's called Lean Startup by Eric Ries. Last name is Ries, R-I-E-S, okay? It is a phenomenal book, okay? And that book basically talks about why never give up is a bad, it's bad advice. Um, he talks about it in terms of pivots. That means changing what you do, 
You know, like, okay, you know, we're making glucose meters more accurate. Okay, that was a bad idea. We need to make strips because that's what makes money. Okay, so it makes strips. Ah, that was a bad idea because making strips is really hard. Let's buy bad strips and make them better. All right, better. I, I know, let's brand it ourselves. <laughs> bad idea. Let's just let other people brand it. Okay, that's a better idea. You know, like, each of those would be considered a pivot. <coughs> okay. <coughs> and in Eric Ries's philosophy, a um, a li the life of a startup, which could be a life of a person, is measured not in terms of how many, what the burn rate is, like, oh, we have 18 months of burn rate left. Bad idea, because, but in terms of how many pivots you have left. Like, how, you know, and how many pivots you have left depends on how quickly you can pivot with how much resources you have. Okay, uh, does that make sense, kind of? So, like, for example, if we have a million dollars in the bank, but we can try this, and it doesn't work, try that, it doesn't work, try that. It, but we can do it all with a million bucks. I mean, we can do three pivots. Then that's just as valuable as if you had $10 million, and, but you were too bureaucratic and you couldn't change and you got stuck and stuff and you could only do three pivots. So in Eric Ries's philosophy, both startups have the same life. You know, they have three pivots. And so, um, to answer your question, not taking no for an answer is different from not, from never giving up. Not taking no for an answer, it's about digging deeper. It's about saying, well, why, why, why are you telling me no here? Like, tell, tell me why you don't. Well, I don't want to give you uh, that price because it'll, you know, because it's uh, our cost is too high. Well, okay. Uh, what if we buy more? Can you buy now? Can you give me a uh, cheap thing or whatever? Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, and then, well, why is that? Well, actually, if I sell more, then I'll get a bigger bonus. Oh, so it's really about the bonus, not your cost structure. Okay, so let's talk about your bonus. Uh, you know, so, and then it, it, it's about digging deeper and learning more. Um, but in terms of knowing when to pivot, you know, read, read Lean Startup, and it'll kind of give you a, a good, really good uh, explanation. And it basically says you should absolutely pivot. You should absolutely give up. Um, but not after cer until certain conditions are met, you know. Uh, basically, the, the short answer is uh, based on user learning. With enough user learning, I mean learning from what users respond to, then pivot. Uh, and if their users are basically saying, "Look, we don't want this product; we want that product," okay, then time to change. But that's not giving up. That's just well, depends on <laughs> depends on who, who who you ask. Anyone else? Yeah. I mean, you have gone through a few startups, so do you think that <coughs> now you are better to know like where you should stop? Like, uh, yeah, that's right a good right? question. Um, I don't know if we're any better. <laughs> um, I think now I would say we're probably more open to feedback. You know, like we, I feel, I feel like as a team we're more secure. Like, okay, hey, tell us, you know, does it suck? Or we'll listen. You know, like we because we know now that if you don't, you're toast. So I think if there's anything I learned, it's like you have to be open to feedback. You have to like be able to be like absolutely, I mean, it's painful to hear critical feedback, you know, but at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is if the customer is happy. That's the only thing that matters. Right? So, I mean, at Misfit, our philosophy is, one of our core philosophies is what we call servant leadership. What that means is, uh, is talking about the inversion of the power pyramid. You know, it's not like the CEO is the head and then the team leads and then the engineers and the customers, you know, no, it's the other way around. Customers are at the center of our organization. We learn from them, they sustain us, they give us feedback, all that good stuff. And then the engineers and the scientists and the designers service them. Team leads service them, those guys. And then I serve the team leads. The board serves the company. Um, that's why on our website you'll see, you know, you have like builders, you know, whatever. And we have different categories of people, like builders, designers, scientists, or thinkers, organizers, and then we have helpers. And that's actually the board. So we call them helpers. So, uh, yeah, I think it's just helped us to be more open to stuff. Any other questions? How do you find investors? Investors? Um, you know, uh, kind of a long story for my first company, but. Well, <coughs> investors have always been people from my previous companies. Uh, yeah, 
uh, investors were from people from my previous company. And um, also, just talking to a number of people. Um, I don't know, it's weird. Finding investment was never really that hard. Um, I think we, the thing is, we didn't really go looking for money until we had like an idea that we felt really comfortable with. That Shreedar and I were like, okay, this is, we thought about this and we know what we're talking about. So we, we never, we didn't, you know, like the, the typical, you know, we saw, we talked to 100 investors and we got one and that's all that matters is that you get one, not that you talk to 100. Well, I actually don't believe in that. <coughs> if you talk to 100 investors and they all are saying no, there's probably, you should probably change your business. I mean, there's probably something wrong. Um, you should talk to like five. You know, friendly, good investors, and if they're all saying, okay, seriously stupid idea, then, okay, then talk to some customers, potential customers, and then they say the same thing, okay, well, maybe we should reconsider. Nothing wrong with that. Sridhar and I went through three different, completely different.